It's time to review Phantasm, boy! And girl, too. There are 15% of you, according to YouTube, are females. So, anyway, uh, let's get on with the review. Phantasm stars A. Michael Baldwin, Bill Thornberry, and is directed by Don Coscarelli. What is up, guys? Uh, welcome to another classic horror review. Uh, this is going to be a movie that I have never seen. Phantasm. Never seen any of the Phantasm movies. And when I say I've never seen a movie, I constantly get like pickles and onions and tomatoes and all kinds of things thrown at me from other horror fans saying, how could you say you've never seen this movie? It happens, people. It freaking happens. I sound like I got a bit of a chip on my shoulder, but that's okay. This is going to be fun. Also, Cody Leach, my horror brother in arms, uh, one of my horror brothers in arms, he is reviewing this movie at the same exact time. So the second this video went up, his video went up too. So be sure to A, sub his channel if you haven't, and B, make sure you check out his video. Uh, fantastic reviewer if you don't know already, which I'm sure you do. But yeah, I actually bought this box set when it was on sale. I think it was on sale at Best Buy quite a few months ago. Um, I believe Ashley Miller cued every, clued everybody in on that. So big shout out to Ashley Miller from uh, Talk Movies with us. If it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't uh, have gotten this, or at least as uh, good of a deal as I did. So, but that is a beautiful set. And it was uh, pretty convenient too, because it kick-started me into high gear. Uh, to finally seeing this franchise. And Cody reached out to me and said, hey, why don't we actually approach this as someone who's seen the movie and then someone who hasn't? So that's, that's what we're doing. Kind of like what we did with uh, our It reviews for the original It. But first off, let's get into the story. What is Phantasm about? Phantasm actually, it comes from uh, a lot of Edgar Allan stories. Uh, Edgar Allan would use the word Phantasm, which uh, means like nightmare really that's what it is a phantasm is a nightmare but the opening of this movie it starts with a sex scene which is not bad for a horror movie uh, but uh, quickly the sex scene goes awry uh, as often does in horror movies the uh, the girl we'll call her the lady in lavender uh, quickly we realize that this is the tall man and she stabs her victim and there's a reason why she stabs her victim, and we find out later. So our main focus of this movie is two brothers, but really the younger brother, Michael. He is 13 years old. He's very tenacious. He's actually really smart. He's quite the mechanic. And, uh, you know, he's just very curious about what's going on with this funeral home. He's actually, you know, being a peeping Tom in the bushes after his brother was that first victim is uh, being buried. And so he sees the tall man. We see the tall man for the first time, and he by himself, lifts up this 500-pound casket and throws it in the hearse. And so right away, this boy, he realizes that something is pretty rotten in Denmark. And so then he runs to his older brother, uh, Jody, and tells him what he saw. And of course, Jody's like, you're freaking high as a kite. There's no way that that guy could lift that casket by himself. But then, of course, Jody uh, looks into it himself. And really what brought him around was when Michael shows him the chopped off fingers uh, and the yellow blood. And so right away when he looks at that, he's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Uh, this is some weird shit. And so for the rest of the movie, Michael and his brother Jody, they are trying to uh, not only save humanity, but uh, beat the tall man, defeat the tall man. Because uh, this is a smaller scale story, you know, but it has the potential to be bigger because of what the tall man is capable of. Now, first, let's talk about like the backstory behind this. Uh, this was, I believe, uh, Don Coscarelli's third movie. Uh, very young director at the time. And this is a great example of doing a film on a really small budget. As a matter of fact, he rented all the equipment on like Fridays. So that way he would have it for the whole weekend and only have to pay for one day. That's being creative and being smart about your budget when it comes to making a film. And when you watch this film, you respect that because you see that a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into it. But, you know, you can tell it's a low-budget film. You can tell that there's certain things that they just weren't capable of doing. Uh, but it doesn't really hurt the movie. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, I think movies on a small budget benefit. They're actually the better movies. Not always, but 
because you have to think outside the box creatively. You don't have every tool at your disposal because of budget constraints. But luckily we have a, an interesting story. We have, uh, dare I say, a horror icon in the making. And then we have some likable characters. So I think those three things alone right there uh, have all the elements of a good movie. Now, one thing I think that works about this movie is it is a sci-fi horror movie. Sci-fi horror is probably one of my favorite subgenres of horror. Uh, Slashers is my favorite, but I love good sci-fi horror, you know, because it forces you to think outside the box and you can get away with things when it comes to your imagination. You know, you're not constantly picking the movie apart uh, because we are dealing with, you know, other dimensions. We're dealing with a different planet. And we're dealing with the tall man, and he's got these freaking, these uh, silver balls or spheres. And uh, th that's one of the cool things, you know, it really stretches your imagination. And you don't know what's around the corner, you know? Whereas when you're dealing with movies that are just like straight up slashers, a lot of times you can guess what's going to happen. But with sci-fi horror, you have no clue. So that was pretty cool when I was watching this, uh, you know, because I knew nothing about the story outside of the tall man himself but even him i didn't know too much about so you know when you got this silver ball that's you know flying through the air and it hits this guy in the head and then it just drills into his skull i was like oh okay this is pretty badass now let's talk about the tall man this is a character played by angus scrim and if you look behind the scenes you could tell that angus really took this character seriously this was a well-trained stage actor before he took this role and he has stated that you have to dial it down a bit when you are playing in movies because the camera is oftentimes right there, you know, or, you know, right there. But but your body only takes up so much of the frame. So you have to change up your performance just a little bit. You don't want to go over the top. And he does it. But he plays this character like pure evil, like just death, you know. There's not a single... Uh, carrying bone in his whole body is even if there is a bone and I always think the best villains don't really say that much and he doesn't kind of like the Terminator in the first Terminator uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger he said very little hell even like first blood Rambo says very little in the first movie and that's another aspect that just kind of lends to the mystery of the tall man you know a lot of times you'll see scenes where he's just like walking across the street and he doesn't say anything you know the atmosphere pretty much gives away uh, how interesting and mysterious he is. But also it's interesting that, uh, you know, he can take the form of anything. He takes the form of the Lady in Lavender to lure his victims uh, into the funeral home. And his ultimate goal is to use them as slaves on his planet. And because of gravity, he has to crush them down into like dwarfs. And they look like Jawas from Star Wars. But that's okay because this was written before they knew about Star Wars. Also, I really like Mike and Jody in this. I think uh, they have a strong bond with each other. You buy their chemistry together. And especially Mike. Michael Baldwin was actually 13 years old uh, when he did this movie. And I've talked ab about this before in reviews. When you're dealing with children, it can be a pretty shaky proposition because if you have a really shitty child actor, it can freaking ruin your movie. But luckily, uh, he was a capable actor. You could tell that he really cared about what was going on. Uh, so it seems like he knew that this was a pretty, you know, serious project. And so not once throughout this whole movie did I not buy his performance. I'm not saying it was Oscar worthy or anything, but he carries the movie on his shoulders and I have to give him credit for that. And uh, I think he's in like the future movies as well. And also I, I have to talk about Reggie. Uh, one of their friends as a matter of fact, there's this scene between Reggie and Jody and they're playing the guitars and That was just a nice moment You know, it's nice when you have a nice character moment and they show a little bit of their talent And then that kind of ties into the end of the movie Which I thought was really cool because Reggie has like this metal device to to kind of mute the uh, the reverb in the guitar And so then he uses that at the end of this movie, but Reggie has what I like to call a uh, sort of a skullet you know, a skullet is when you're bald up top, but you have like a mullet in the back. Although I don't know if his was a mullet. He had a ponytail. So there's got to be another name for that because it's not a full on mullet, but it's pretty damn daring to do something like that. Now, I got to say the silver sphere is pretty damn cool in this too. 
Uh, it's like I was saying earlier about sci-fi horror. You can really do anything. It's all up to your imagination. And what's sad is the guy who designed the, uh, the Silver Sphere, Willard Green, actually died before the movie even came out. So he didn't actually get to see the, the thing in action. But that Silver Sphere is just as important as the tall man himself today. Like, those two components are the first two things people think of when they think of Phantasm. You can have so much fun with that. And it's only used, uh, I think, twice in the whole movie. Only a couple times. You know, because of budget constraints, this movie is pretty, it's pretty scaled back. It, it leans on character moments more than it does on special effects. But that's okay. It actually works pretty well. Now, another thing that was interesting about this is how they use fear as like a plot point in this. There's one scene where Mike, he's at this, I think it's like a psychic or something like that. And she has him put his hand in this this box and you know it starts like squeezing his hand or hurting his hand or whatever and the only way that he can um you know get rid of the pain is to not be afraid of it and it's it's interesting because it's, it seems like this is something that they use in horror movies a lot nightmare on elm street actually did this you know where if you're not afraid of freddy then you can defeat him and i know there's been another couple of movies that have done this too but I always find that interesting that uh, directors do that in horror movies, you know. You can use fear as a weapon against the enemy. Now, uh, as far as any cons for this movie, uh, I would say I just got off of a like uh, Italian horror kick and I prefer my horror to be on the stylistic side. Hell, even John Carpenter's Halloween has a lot of style in it actually when it comes to the cinematography, to the directing. and. This is more like straightforward horror, and when you're dealing with science fiction, it's nice to add a little bit of style in there. Uh, and so it, it's hard to call it a con, but you know, if I'm comparing this to like other horror icons, hell, even like the big three, Nightmare on Elm Street has quite a bit of style too, actually. I didn't find this movie like as engaging as, you know, Michael, Freddy, and Jason, you know, or like Italian horror. Uh, I, I really just get invested in those characters, those plots. And I will say that this one does feel like a bit more dated. I don't know what it is. It's hard to make a movie timeless, uh, but certain directors can do it. They can, they can make a movie like, you know, 40 years ago, and still today it just, it just seems timeless. You know, the fashion still kind of fits in. This one, it did feel a little bit dated. But uh, I still had a really good time. I am not a Phantasm fanatic after watching this. I will tell you that right now. But I am curious to check out the sequels. And I've heard the second one is uh, better than the first one. So really looking forward to that. So for that, I would definitely give this movie like a high humdrum, if I'm being honest. I wasn't like blown away by it, but it kept me engaged the whole time. Uh, I, you know, And I wanted to know what was going on. And I definitely dug the tall man. Like... I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with the tall man in the future movies. So anyway, guys, that is my review for Phantasm. What are your thoughts on this movie? Post in the comments. Be sure to check out Cody Leach's review if you haven't. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we do Free Fall Fridays. If you like what I'm doing, hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and drum them out.